We're going to continue our uh, series in uh, Lessons from the Hill. Um, some of you know it as the Beatitudes. Some of you know it as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and last week we talked a lot about Jesus' choice of, of the apostles and his disciples and how he was bringing a culture to this world that is radically different and far superior to any culture that exists on this planet. And so you need to look at, as we read these and go through this Sermon on the Mount, you need to look at it not as a list of do's and, and don'ts and, and, and some things we need to aspire to. We need to look at it as a culture that God is bringing into an existing culture. Because all of us live in cultures. Cultures is simply a way of doing life with a group of people. You have your own individual culture, the way you do stuff. You, if you're in a family, you have family culture, the way that comes, how, how you guys do family. And part of the uh, issues that often encompasses relationships is you bring two people from two different family cultures, mix that culture, and you got issues. And, you know, and some of us come from very dysfunctional cultures, and, and, and coming into any kind of healthy place freaks you out because that is not the way you do life. All of us come from different cultures and communities. In the United States, they said there's nine different cultures. You have the East Coast culture, you have the Northeast Coast culture, you have the Southern culture, you have the Midwest culture, you have the uh, Left Coast or West Coast culture. Um, <laughs> You have different cultures that are taking place all the time, and they're intermingling. Now we have this massive immigration issue that has brought people in with radically different cultures than what we have. And so we have this mix of things, and it causes oftentimes conflict. Jesus says, hey, everybody, I'm bringing in a culture that it doesn't matter what culture you're from. It is far superior it is far superior, and it is radically different. Every culture on the planet has a sense of justice. Not all of them have a sense of justice for all, but all of them have a sense of justice. So all, everybody's looking to get ahead. You have different aspects of culture. Everybody's looking for some of the same things, some more global, like the whole community they want to rise up. Some just care about power for the few. So there's this dynamic that's taking place. Jesus is talking to his apostles and his disciples, and he's telling them about his culture, what he is bringing, which is different than the way they understood the culture to be. They grew up in the Roman culture. The Roman government oversaw the land they grew up in, lived in. They were not Roman citizens, as far as we know, most of them anyway. They were Jews. So they were an oppressed people. The Roman government, if you were a Roman citizen, you could own land. You, could, you had uh, the government judicial Give me a word here that I could help. System. I know, it's tough. Sorry, Tony. <laughs> they had a system that protected them. They had rights. Most of the people didn't. The Roman culture had about almost 50% of the people under that culture were slaves. They had no rights at all. So theirs was a, a society that was in the natural, in the secular world, very different. And only some people had it going on. And then you had the Jewish religious who they were, they believed God was going to send the Messiah and they were going to take over and they were going to be the head, not the tail. And they were going to have power and riches. And they were going to be like the Romans. And they were going to have... So even though they were religious, they had a mindset very similar to the Romans who were on top. And then Jesus comes along. He draws these guys in. And the Jews also had one other plus thing. They were 
right with God, especially the religious leadership. So they were going to have all the stuff in the natural, and they were going to be cool with God. It was going to be great. And then Jesus comes along and tells them about this culture that he has from a kingdom called heaven, and it was going to be implanted, or it was going to invade this earth and establish a different culture. And so it's, we pick up this, and let me give you a couple things before we even get into the word here. Some of the list of our own culture's beatitudes, the attitude to have. How many of us have, have grown up and, and, and adopted into our lives hard hearts? Yeah, we're going to be hard-hearted. Why? We're not going to get hurt anymore. That's part of our culture, is to be hard-hearted, to distance ourselves. Why? Because we don't want any more pain. So blessed are the hard-hearted. Why? They let nothing hurt them. Blessed are the manipulators. Anybody got any manipulators in here? You might not want to raise your hand. <laughs> Tell on yourself. I manipulate. Because <laughs> we'll raise our hand thinking that's a good thing. It's not. Oh. <laughs> why? Why? Blessed are the manipulators. Why? They get their way in the end. Blessed are the arrogant. They have real high self-esteem. Blessed are the pushy. They get ahead. Blessed are the strong. Why? They know how to win. Those are some of our cultural beatitudes. Blessed are the powerful. Good to be in a power position. Why? They call the shots. That's why some of us will not be in a relationship and allow anyone to have any power over us. Why? We grew up where we found out that the powerful person gets to lord it over the weaker and so what do we take into our head and ultimately get down into our heart as a belief system? No one's going to lord it over us. Oh, no. That makes for a great relationship. Because <laughs> what happens is you are no longer partners. You go into the relationship already and in this corner. <laughs> wearing the dress. <laughs> and in this corner. And you go in as rivals. Because it's a fight for position, because no one's going to lord over. So partnership ends, and then we wonder, why do we have so many issues? Blessed are the workaholics. We love those holics. We don't like all the holics, but that one's a good one. We bless that one in our culture. Why? Because they get things done. Blessed are the beautiful. That's a beautiful beatitude we have in our culture. Why? The world exalts them. Blessed are the rich, for they get anything they want. Blessed are the successful. Why? They get to boast. Blessed are the schmoozers. Why? Sucking up pays. <laughs> Some of us have the, the, the cultural belief of rebels. Blessed are the rebels. Why? They know how to have fun. At great cost. <laughs> Blessed are the confident. They appear to have it together. Blessed are the ragers. They know how to shut someone up. Blessed are the selfish. They know how to take care of number one. You know, these are all things that can happen inside of us that affect the relationship. Jesus comes in and he says, I'm starting a different culture. That's why when we get God into our life, there really becomes a culture clash because all of us in here have cultural beliefs in our own little world of how it should go. So when the Lord says to forgive someone, how often do we say, yeah, but not for that? We struggle with that because Jesus' culture is so radically different. But he says, listen, that's what my culture's about. And I'm telling you, it's far superior. It's far superior. So let's jump in to see a little bit about what he's talking about this culture is all about. In Luke 6, verse 17, and I'm going to read through a number of verses here. It says, he went down with him. After he chose, he went up on the hill 
chose his 12 apostles out of the disciples. Then it says he went back down in Luke to a level place, a place where he could actually sit and talk. And the people were gathered around him, and we see different groups of people. It says a large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and all the people... And the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. That is a mixed bag of cultures. Jerusalem Jews thought they were all that in a bag of chips. They were at the, they were at the, you know, the, the, they were at the seat of, Jew, of Jewish power. They were the far more religious ones. They had the temple and all that other stuff. Then you had the people by the coast who were a little different. Then you had the people that came there with diseases. So, and the the righteous ones, the the real religious, wouldn't be near them because that would make them unclean. So that you had all these different people with all these different views, and then you had the disciples, those who had been following Jesus. Jesus had been healing people, been casting out demons. He'd been doing amazing things. He'd been teaching things that they had never heard before. He was just so different. And then he's going to tell them now what his culture, really break down for the first time what his culture is about. This is how it looks in his culture. And it says this, looking at his disciples, so he narrowed his focus to the group that were already with him. And he said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, and they insult you, and reject your name as evil because you hang out with me, because of the Son of Man, because you're connected to me. That sounds like a winner group, doesn't it? It's like, these guys listening to that, just that portion, it, that's not the poor. That's, that's to be blessed. The, what? This doesn't sound at all like we win. Then he says this. Rejoice in that day that you're persecuted because great is your reward in heaven. For what is, that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Then he goes on to some woes. Woe is not a judgmental. It's like be careful. Watch out. This is not good. He says, woe to you who are rich for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Imagining, imagine these guys saying, it's radically different. I don't even know if I want to be a part of this. How many want to be? What culture says, hey, you know what, being rich, mm, not good. So let's break this down a little bit. And, and, and so today we're going to look at the first attribute of belonging to the kingdom of God. And that's in Luke 6.20. It says there, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. First thing he wants them to know is that he's a blessing God. That God wants to, as I shared with you guys a couple weeks ago, add value. He wants to add value to your life. Wherever you're at, he wants to take it to a better place. He wants, the, another aspect of the word blessed is happy. He wants us happy. And he says this, blessed are you who are poor. Now, it's not speaking about physical poverty. There's no place in Scripture that says physical poverty, beautiful. In fact, we are mandated numerous places in Scripture to alleviate that. There's nowhere in Scripture that says being penniless and being homeless is a spiritual plus. He says, listen, your job is to help make people's lives better. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the condition of a person. From God's perspective... You and I are all poverty-stricken. Why? You're all decaying. 
You know, man has a crazy way of internalizing some things and externalizing others. They've done studies that show that when people are successful, they like to internalize that. And by that I mean they like to say, well, I work hard. Well, I've been hammering away at this for years. Well, I've done this and I've done that and I've done this. And they internalize success as if it's something from them. You'll see it a lot in parenting. When your kids are doing great, people go, oh, great job raising your kids. Well, what about when they're doing crappy? <laughs> if you're going to take victory for the good, you better take it for the bad, too. He said, but we tend to do that. We internalize success. Failure, on the other hand, we tend to externalize. Well, I, that, that, that happened because my boss... Terrible. They show nepotism here. They're this over there. I'd have a great marriage if he'd just get his act together. Well, our marriage failed because of that, 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 and this. This thing messed up because we externalize it. Jesus is saying, listen, the issue with you is internal. You are internally messed up. We all know it too. I have insecurity issues. I've had them forever. And uh, I was at a conference two weeks ago, and I walked in, and I felt insecure. I know there's nothing to be insecure about. I'm super good looking. <laughs> I have amazing giftings. <laughs> and I'm a whore. <laughs> Horrible liar. But anyway. <laughs> but I, I walked in there and, and my, you know, I know in here I'm equal. But I go right back to little Joe. Feeling less than. And so what do I do? I go up to everybody. How you doing? I'm Joe. Why? Better to look confident. I'm feeling all inferior, but I'm acting. Confident as the day is long. You guys should see me at first service. When I get done with first service preaching, I go into my office and go, what the hell? <laughs> what was that all about? <laughs> but when I come out second service, da -da 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 I come out confident, like I got it going on. And, you know, because I've compensated. I learned, you know, I got this insecure thing. See, the beautiful thing is I know that about me. I know I'm poor. Every Sunday, you guys know every Sunday, I pray, like last night I was up for hours as usual. I just can't, I don't know what it is, but I'm praying to God, oh God, help me tomorrow. I, I know I needed you last week, but I really need you this week. I really, and you know what? There's a part in me that feels like I shouldn't be asking God that. For the love of the Lord, I've been doing it for 25 years. I should be all right at this. I should have my act together at some point in time. And, but I know I need God all the time. Jesus said that's the prerequisite. Because when he said blessed are the poor, it's present tense. You're always poor. I'm a, I'm a dad. I'm, I, I need help being a dad. He says, those that ask for help know their condition. They're the ones ripe for the kingdom. They're the ones that God can use. The problem is, some people don't know that. Or they lie about it. How many of us have met people that, you know, they act like they got it together? You know they don't. None of us do. From God's perspective, we're all poor. And then he uses this example in verse 24, I believe, where he uses the example of money because nothing attaches us to here more than money. You need it for everything in this natural world that you and I live in. But he says this, he says, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then we have the parallel because for every blessing he gives a woe. He says, Woe to these guys Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. And like I said, woe doesn't mean judgment. 
It means misplaced. It means you're making a huge mistake. How? Listen, if you're a, let's say you have 10 million in the bank. When you die, what are you? Dead! <laughs> you're not a millionaire no more. You're dead. So he says, listen, if you put your security, because that's what he's talking about, you put your security in this thing over here, and I've seen it a bunch of times. I see people, you know, we deal with people that are coming up oftentimes, you know, they haven't peaked the ground yet. They're so far down. They come up and God starts to prosper them and they start to get a blessing and all of a sudden, that blessing becomes their security. They were all into God helping them. But all of a sudden, they start to become independent and they place their security in their jobs. They're this, they're that, the other. And the Lord is telling them, he says, oh my gosh, that's a huge mistake. He's not against us having money. He's a, he says money has tremendous power. It has power for good or evil. We are given things to use them, not to depend upon them for our sustenance. That's only God. He says, but, but woe are you who are rich, who put your dependence in that, because at some point you leave it. Say you have it all the way till the time you die. Once you transition into heaven, you'll be insecure. Your comfort was left behind you. And so what's the opposite of comfort? You're uncomfortable now. He says, I don't want you to be like that. He says, listen, blessed are the poor, those who realize. They are poor inside. And you are poor inside. The problem is some people don't realize it, don't admit it, don't accept it, and they put on all these facades. In fact, how many of us in here, sitting here tonight, you intentionally try to act like you don't have needs? I've talked to married couples that, that you know, they try not to express their needs to each other. I don't want to be needy. It's like you are needy. Just be honest. You do have needs. If you didn't have a need, why'd you get married? I don't need anything. You need lots of things. It's a mindset we have that God says it's a facade. Lots of guys have this where I, I don't like to share my feelings because I, 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 you know, I need to be strong. You're not strong. You're a hurting human being. Why? Well, how do you know that? You're a human being. Who isn't? So from God's perspective, we're all poor. We're all in continual need. And this is, a th this is, this is my challenge for you this week. Every day you get up, tell God, I need you today. You struggle in your relationship, I need you in my relationship today. I know I asked you yesterday. I need you today. I need you. Once we start thinking we got it going on, that's a bad trail. Man, and I, and I think that's one of the reasons God will allow us to continue to stumble and things to draw us, keep us close to him. Because our tendency is to place our security in other things. How many of us sitting here that are not in relationship thinking, man, if I just found that right relationship, I'd be having, oh man, if I just had, you know, if I just got that $10 more an hour job. I just got this, if I just got that, you're always going to be in need. In fact, he goes on, and, and, and some of you are sitting there saying, well, you know, I'm not wealthy. How many are not wealthy in here? How many are not wealthy? You're, you're wrong. You, sitting here today, every one of you are in the top 5% of wealth 
in the world. If you make over $40,000 a year, you are in the top 3% of the world. If you make over 100000 you are in the top 1% of the world. So let's just say we're all in the top 5% because anything you make is far superior than most of the world. So there are about 7 billion people. So everyone sitting in here today is wealthier than 6 billion 587 million 67,823 people in this world today. In fact, you are 157 times wealthier than a billion of the people. 157 times wealthier. In fact, it would take, you, for you sitting in here, whatever your income level is, it would take off 231 poor people all year to make what you make in a month. You're just here. It's all about perspective and understanding the culture. You are rich if you look at this world. But yet, every one of us in here feels some sense of poverty, some sense of, if, well, it would be better if we had a little bit more. It'd be better, because why? That's part of our culture. We are never okay with where we're at. We always want more. Why? Because we're, you know, not only are we 5% of the world's wealthiest people, we use 50% of the world's goods. So for every two things produced in the world, the United States gets one of them. That's why people come here. If I lived in Mexico, if I lived in Guatemala, if I lived in some of those countries and I make $8 a week and I come here and mow somebody's lawn and I make $9, $10 an hour, I could actually send money home and help my family. I'd do it in a heartbeat. And I get the, the law and all that other stuff. I'm just saying the bigger picture. So you understanding where you're at, and you and I have the opportunity to advance ourselves astronomically in life, in every area. So this is the deal. Do not put your security in that. The rest of the world looks at you and go, what in the world do you have to worry about? What in the world? My friend who's an Egyptian pastor, he said when they brought over some people from Syria, and this is a decade ago, and they went to a supermarket, they were blown away that there was food everywhere. And she was thirsty, and so she went to the water fountain, and she wondered how much they had to pay so she could get a drink of water. And they said, oh, it's free. Couldn't believe it. You mean you can drink water for free at a, out of a fountain? And it doesn't have 25 diseases in it? Mind-blowing to them. You go, and, and then we think about us. Look how insecure we are about that. Look how much we stress on that when we're rich beyond most of the world's wildest imagination. Can't even grasp it. I mean, I got four TVs in my house. Why? Costco had a sale. <laughs> Isn't that what you're supposed to do? It doesn't, you know what I mean? It's not like it's a logical thing. It, it, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. But from God's perspective, you and me are still poverty stricken. We're still hurting. You all look amazing. 
But I know lots of you in here are hurting right now in your hearts. You know, there's, there's areas, like Father's Day, some of you I know got great regrets. I know guys that haven't seen their kids in years. Kids won't talk to them. You know, I, there's lots of stuff going on in people's lives. That, and, and God knows that. And he sees the whole world as one big poverty-stricken place. And he's introducing a culture that says, all you poor can come in. All you poverty-stricken can come in. You just have to admit that you're in need. And Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. He goes, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Who, who isn't weary and burdened? Is there anybody? We're all weary and burdened. He says, come to me, all of you like that, and I will give you rest. That culture is crazy. Who would have such culture? God says, that's the way I roll. We're all poverty stricken. Some of us acknowledge it. He says, listen, and learn, come, take my yoke upon you. Hook up with me and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, the inner person. So he used the word souls on purpose. That's the inner man. He didn't say, oh, you'll have rest, you'll have a garage for your cars. He said, you'll have rest in here. I will help the poverty place in you. And he says, listen, you, you come to my kingdom, you seek that. You be a soul healer in other people's lives, I'll give you everything you need. You become dependent on that stuff and you hoard it for you. You're no, you're, you're, you know, yeah, you might be my kid, but you're of no value to the kingdom. You're supposed to be salt and light. You're supposed to be a part of the healing to the world. You're supposed to introduce them that saying, yeah, even you are welcome. Yeah, you're welcome too. You just have to acknowledge you're a problem. And while some people will say, well, I'm not really, you know, a, a, a problem. Well, Romans 3.23 says you're a problem. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what that means? That means you're a poor reflection of the glory of God. You were made in the image of God. I was made in the image of God, and I'm a poor reflection of that. So I need to acknowledge that I'm poor. Why? We all have sinned and fall short. What is crazy is some people won't acknowledge it. Why? Because they don't own that their issues are theirs, are internal. They look at it as all out there. I was talking to somebody recently. They don't go to church here. We wouldn't have that issue in this church, but. <laughs> this person was like 58 years old. And all they talked about was their lousy childhood. It's like, you know, you've been an adult for a long time now. The reason, externalized, the reason I never got ahead is because dad did this and mom did that and this thing over here happened. <laughs> and they're stuck in this thing. The thing is they can't change it. So they focus on it all the time and they're lost in it and it governs their life. It's like, listen, if you just internalize, these external things happened affected me internally, messed me up in the way I look at life and do life, I want to fix this part that got messed up so I can proceed in life, then that's where God goes, perfect. Now we're in the game. Now we're going to do that. Because God doesn't fix our past. He frees us from it governing us. He says, listen, the reason you don't succeed is the reason you don't succeed succeed. It's you. I'm for you. I'm poor. See, some of us in here, we're poor in fear. We're poverty. We're, 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 we're poor. We have fear governing everything in us. God says, you need to get rid of that. I need God. Make me courageous. I'm poor in my relationship. Well, then God, make me good in it.
God, give me something. What are you pouring? Give me something. <laughs> Wrong crowd again. <laughs> Tolerance, judgment, patience. I'm pouring patience. Forgiveness. What? Pride. Yeah, that you're poverty stricken. You're you're prideful. That you're deep poverty. Why? You're not better than anybody. And pride is flip sided. You know, pride is a two sided coin. I'm better than everybody. Some of us in here have reverse pride. <gasps> Everybody's better. <laughs> I'm the least of everybody. Everybody's God's favorite but me. Everybody gets to move ahead but me. That's reverse pride. It's all about you. Listen, I'm my own worst problem. Huh? Resentment. Yeah. That, that, that's what he's... It, see, God will open the kingdom. And it, remember that he said it's a present tense thing. Whatever you're, whatever you're poor now, he wants to help you. One, you acknowledge it. Second, you want help for it. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. So why don't we stand up? We're going to get out of here early today. For normal people, that would be on time. I love Philippians 3.12 when Paul's writing towards the end of his ministry. He says, listen, I haven't accomplished all this stuff. I don't have all this stuff down. I'm still growing. I'm still working. Your need for God is always present. It's always present. So why don't we just take a moment, close our eyes, ask the Lord if you haven't already snapped to, what are you pouring? What are you poverty stricken in that you need some, some help in? And after you identify that, Ask the Lord to help you. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burden. What are you, what are you poverty stricken? And, and, what, and, and, and you know, what facades do you put up? Because it's self-analysis that opens the door for healing in the kingdom of God. It's not an external deal. He says he'll make that. Fear of being alone. Can't admit I fail. I don't like to take ownership for the things that happen in my life. I'm stuck. Jesus, I'm stuck. Help me. So can you just ask the Lord right now to help you in that area? However you want to say it, you can say it out loud, you can say it in your heart. Help me, God. Put my security in. What do you put your security in? Uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I, you hear what everybody's praying. I thank you that you're a great dad, that you will help your children, that you have promised to do that. So whatever they have brought to you this morning, whatever they need help in, I pray, God, you will show them what they need to do, whether it's through your word, whether it's your spirit, whether you, somebody says something, whatever it is, that you would show them this week, even in the next couple days, even possibly today, God, even now, that you would show them what they need to do. And then, God, I pray that you would give them the strength to embrace your culture in dealing with it, your ways in how to deal with that, and that any other thing they throw up would just melt. It would just have no effect, that they would be sold out, that I would be sold out. To do it your way. Because blessed are the poor. You'll be blessed in that acknowledgement. 
So we thank you for that. And all God's kids said? Amen. All right, have a great day, you guys.